here we are on our 16th episode and our final discussion on questions emanating from Unit 4 of the We the People program. It is the Constitution in American Life with the Friends of Publius, where every week we attempt to bring light to the, to bring light, yes, light, uh, to the gray, squishy, and fuzzy elements of the U.S. Constitution. So I got a text this morning from a fellow fop letting me know that he had discovered another rare diamond in the field of rock and roll and R&B music. So let's do another segment of what what's your musical whistle with Professor Tim Moore in the field of music appreciation. So, uh, Professor Moore, why so excited about the Tusky Brothers and who in the H.E. Double Toothpicks are the Tusky Brothers? Uh, well, up until yesterday, uh, on my way out of church, I ha- I've befriended this 17, 18 year old kid who likes Sturgill Simpson. So we've been exchanging uh, recommendations of late. And he said, hey, Mr. Moore, you need to check out the Teskey Brothers. You might like them. They seem to be old school R&B. So I promptly came home and and, uh, and was listening to them. And I've been listening to them all day. Uh, I like old school R&B, like, you know, Wilson Pickett, Sam Cooke, uh, Otis Redding on, on all of that. So these guys are from Australia. Uh, and they sound uh, very much like uh, 60s R&B. Now I understand there's a little bit of pushback from Professor Cavadon. Now is that is that uh, true, Chris? Well, no. I, I I actually, you know, when uh, when Tim sends out a music recommendation, I absolutely uh, I I uh, I take it seriously because he he knows his tunes. He is a he is a he, everybody thinks he's a historian, but he's really a frustrated soul singer. He's a savant. Um, he is. He is. Um, and so I listen to it, but. When he starts, you know, naming off these guys that I consider to be, as I said, on the Mount Rushmore of R&B, uh, you know, Otis Redding, uh, Sam Cooke, you know, Wilson Pickett, among others. Um, the, the, the Teskey brothers were good, but they're not that good. So, well, they're good. You know, they're good. I, how long have these guys been around? Uh, they first album came out in 2018, I think. Okay, let's give them some time. Let's give them some time to, yeah, you know, yeah. to, to let the seasoning, you know. Uh, well, I mean, David, you know me very well, and you know that I'm always on the cutting edge of everything. So I need to be very, very current and, and you know, modern. Uh, and so uh, I, I like to keep up with the youth. Mm. Yeah, fashion, finger food, you know. Yes, you're definitely on the cutting edge. Of, uh, so of modern, <laughs> so modern, yes. postmodern sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you getting a kickback from Ace for that sweatshirt? Uh, Is that a little product placement? Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. Oh gosh! So you know, students, teachers, I hope you notice the synchronicity of Professor Moore's analysis of music and the Constitution. How. <laughs> There's some symbiosis uh, there, the connective tissue between the two in the mind and uh, 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 voice of Professor uh, Moore is, is I don't know, it's just, it's it's poetic uh, there. That's why he said he is a savant uh, and, and uh, you know, the most, the, he is the Renaissance man of, of the Fops. He kind of, those two ideas kind of go together like tuna salad and Miracle Whip. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the Miracle Whip goes into the making of the tuna salad, if I understood I, I, I uh, think Chef Williams. Or uh, uh, you, yeah. you just feed the tuna the t- Miracle Whip. <laughs> oh, yes. We're going to have a food show starting next season, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Look forward to it uh, there. So let's let's turn to Article 2 and the Take Care Clause and the Implied Powers of the Administrative State. What a segue. Um, what a segue. It is. It is. Uh Addressing the North Carolina Ratifying Convention, William McLean declared that the Faithful Execution Clause was one of the Constitution's best provisions. If the president takes care to see the laws faithfully executed, it will be more than is done in any government on the continent. For I will venture to say that our government and those of the other states are, with respect to the execution of the laws, in many respects, mere ciphers. So is the take care clause one of the best provisions? Are Americans mere ciphers? What duties or obligations are implied by the take care clause? 
Can the president and his administrative agencies decide policy within the ambiguity of con congressional language? And are we living in a counter-revolutionary period as the GOP and their minions on the Supreme Court move closer and closer to closing down the administrative state that dominated 20th century American policy and politics? Let's turn to our experts, pa expert panel here uh, to find answers to these and hopefully other questions on Article 2 and the power of the executive branch. So, Professor Moore, beyond your musical knowledge, we always turn to you, I think, for uh, some of the language and you know meaning of the words in the Constitution and uh, the context of that. Uh, this week, uh, in preparation, I was talking actually with a, a number of We the People teachers, and uh, there seemed to be a consensus that the take care clause of Article 2 is synonymous or linked to a significant degree with John Locke's notion of executive prerogative power. To what extent, if any, do you agree with this finding of this small group of We the People teachers? Well, first of all, before we get to that, uh, it's interesting you chose McLean to start out with because later on in that speech, he, he uh, when it comes to appointments, he actually proposed a potential amendment to uh, have appointments only be temporary, like there's a sunset on them. Uh, so, so I mean, uh, it, the, the quote you pulled was sounded like a full throttled uh, uh, endorsement of uh, – uh, the importance of it, but he also caveats it. But maybe, maybe they ought to be temporary appointments. But um, I'm just curious. Isn't that true of almost all of them? <laughs> it seems that uh, some point or the other that they're yeah, pulling yeah. back. <laughs> yeah, know? it's uh, hence the problem with original intent. Um, I think you're. Uh, I I'll I'll try to be gentle on this, but I I don't know that I buy the argument. Uh, well, let me put it this way. I think it's problematic. Uh, that um, to say that the take care clause is somehow related or rooted in um, Locke's notion of prerogative. Um, and I think just conceptually, um, it's compare, I'd say it's comparing apples, apples and oranges. I mean, Locke um, lives in a world where there's, I mean, he's coming out of uh, this notion of divine right um which creates a wide berth of executive power if you have divine right the king can do no wrong um so i think conceptually it uh, i think there's a problem uh this notion of prerogative comes in a time frame that's totally different than i think the time frame that the founders were doing okay uh, well i got to ask are you saying that that we should just eliminate any discussion of the prerogative power having anything to do no with American no, not. constitutional thought. But as I understood your question, your your question was, is it based in or related to or um the the prerogative? And and I would say that uh conceptually there's a problem there. Uh I think also the design of the constitution creates a problem of assuming that as well. I mean with separation of powers, um uh, checks and balances. So I think uh I think uh, and as well as a written constitution. Now, I understand that there's big C and small C. There's um, there's always an element of interpretation in a written constitution. But the fact that we have a written constitution and um, it's argued to be a constitution with enumerated powers. So I think conceptually the time the times in which these two ideas emerge are different. And I think the constitutional design itself is different. Um, and militates against that clean. It, uh, I guess I moderate it by saying it's not a it's not a slam dunk at all that they're that they're related. And and second of all, I think um, if I can quickly go through, um, I mean, the Articles of Confederation executive power was done by committees, um, and they did have. This is where maybe the the, the linkage is. Uh, there is a little bit of linkage here because uh, some of those committees had wide berth of what they could do within the Articles Congress, uh, but it was a committee. Um, in the um, in the Philadelphia Con Convention, they talked about uh, this uh, potential for prerogative power. Um, they uh, they didn't talk about it very much, and then the two committees actually inserted statements that could conceivably be interpreted as such. 
Um, but there's no clear indication from the convention that they, they intended this to be in any way related to prerogative. In the ratification debates, holy buckets, um, the anti-federalists, uh, we'll put these in the, in the resources, but there's a lot of anti-federalist backlash uh, against appointment powers as well as the control over those appointments. In fact, um, one of the great uh, things I just noticed this morning as I was looking through this again, there's a letter from uh, William S uh, Sims to Peter Osgood, and he actually talks about uh, he's suspicious of this take care clause. And he says, it seems to me that down the road, there won't be much difference between the executive doing the interpretation of the Constitution versus just enforcing the Constitution. Now, I think that's quite remarkable for, for 1788 to use literally language uh, that is very modern. You know, it, is the executive doing constitutional interpretation through um you know, through this mechanism called the take care clause. Um, and I also think the first federal Congress, there's a few things that come up in first federal Congress. They're talking about the removal power is one of the very first bills they considered in Congress, the first federal Congress. And they were talking about, uh, you know, could the executive remove uh, somebody that had been congressionally approved in the cabinet? And Madison makes a couple of speeches, um, full throated speeches in favor of executive power in terms of removal. But the principles he's talking about is control over his parts of the Constitution that he has control over. And that'll be a big issue down the road of history in the 20th century with the emergence of the, um, the administrative state. So I, I would say it's a mixed answer to make the clear linkage to prerogative power. Um, well, I think you understand the spirit of which it is asked, and that is you know, as I opened up our discussion here about the squishiness and fuzziness of the cost of, of, of some constitutional language, I think we'd all agree that there isn't a precision to the t language of take care that they will be faithfully executed, that the law will be. All well, right? but, it's in, but it's in the context. I mean, within that article, Article 2, there's a whole lot of stuff where the president kind of is um, is inferior to the Congress. You know, in that same section, he recommends legis. He can recommend legislation. Um, he has to report to Congress. So it's within it's within the context of him being, uh, in a sense, the take care care clause can be argued to be, uh, I am the errand boy of Congress to implement laws done by them. The take care of the laws uh, is how it's phrased. So uh, I understand the spirit, but I think contextually as well as textually there might be a little problem in in connecting it to prerogative in the locking sense i would can i jump in here is that yeah, all right of course um i would and i understand the, the question but i would i would go even further than tim i don't think there is a connection um i think if you look at uh what uh, tim you're gonna have to help me out here because i know i'm gonna get this wrong like the pennsylvania state constitution the new york state constitution they create yeah. executives and they have the executive power, and they require that the law be uh, faithfully executed. So you council, of, council of censors in Pennsylvania and the executive uh, uh, council revision, actually, in New York. Yeah. yeah, so, I mean, they've got the language in these early state constitutions. And I would even fast forward to a case we'll probably talk about in a little bit is Youngstown Sheet and Tube Company versus Sawyer where uh, Justice Jackson, you know, in his concurring opinion says is clear by this clause, right, that the president is not a lawmaker. And as I understand Locke's prerogative, um, that allows the executive, in his view, the king, to make those laws. And I think when we start to look at some of the case law in this, it becomes clear that the president, as Tim said, can recommend legislation. However, um, it is very limiting. I mean, I think the take care clause, it, it bestows power, but it also limits the executive power to take care of the law with the laws that have been passed. Yeah, so. I'd, I'd agree with that. And I guess my contribution to this would be if you connect the article to all executive power, right? Because I, I can't, I, you see in the arguments of those who believe in the unified unitary theory of executive power, that to me connects 
to, to Locke's prerogative power. But it's only one step away. If you read the take care clause about the laws being executed, I think, Kim, you're right. The, I think the, the, the common, the rational way to read that is that, well, Congress makes the laws. <laughs> but if you have this theory of executive power where the executive is not only enforcing laws, but can make laws unto him or herself, then I think it would relate back to Locke. But it would take that that step. Oh, you have to read more than just the take care clause. You have to read a little bit more of Article 2, I think. Well, let's kind of bring it into, I guess, the not necessarily the present, but the last 100 years or so, <laughs> Professor Kavanaugh, two controversial issues in the last 10 years involving executive power have been in the field of immigration and uh, specifically DACA and the duty and obligation for the U.S. government to cover its debts, uh, Section 4 of the 14th Amendment. And according to Lawrence Tribe, in both of these cases, the president has a duty to act to promote the common good, especially if Congress refuses or fails to do so. Do you agree with the professor on this? Um, to a point, um, I'm going to put in the resources a link to an article uh, by Jack Goldsmith, who is a, also a, a very heavyweight scholar that uh, is worth following and reading. Um, uh, because he talks about the take care clause that establishes what we know as something called prosecutorial discretion. And what that means, students, is that the president has the authority then once a law is passed, and I'm going to say once a law is passed, to link it to our, our just our prior discussion there, to carry out that law, he's got wiggle room. That's prosecutorial discretion. And with DACA, deferred action for early childhood arrivals is for is uh was under the Obama administration. And so uh you know the what we call the dreamers. Uh, kids that were brought here at a young age up to maybe 15 or 16. Um, uh, they're brought here by their parents. They're, they're undocumented. Um, those, you know, trying to provide a, not necessarily a pathway to citizenship, but they were going to be the last people the um, Homeland Security uh, would be looking at for deportation. So in carrying out the law as, as written by Congress, uh, the Obama administration was going to move those folks, the dreamers, to the back of the line and also try and provide some pathways for them to remain in the country. Because many brought here as infants or small children, teenagers uh, through no, um, you know, they had no say in it. They were brought here. So he's going to look to deport, um, you know, people that are perhaps convicted felons, uh, people that are in trouble with the law. Those people moved to the front of the line for deportation and other people moved to the back of the line. It's an oversimplification of that process, but that is that prosecutorial discretion that the take care clause allows for. Right now, in terms of paying the debts, gosh, uh, that is a I think that's a tougher one again, because that is a congressional power. I would like to know uh, Professor Tribe, who I absolutely follow. And, and he is a man. He is a a legit uh, legal professor that's educated a lot of people and uh, smart people in this country. Um, you know, uh, to prom pr to promote this, yes, to take the law into his or her own hands as executive, that I, I'd have to take a step back on to say this. Um, you know, we're going to find out, um, you know, we're taping this show uh, right now, recording this show, and by the end of this week, uh, the new Speaker of the House has got his first big test, and that is to see if we can get a spended, spending package through to make sure we don't default on those debts. But I would say um, the, the president has the power to promote it, to perhaps deal with members of Congress, but this is a congressional power. Well, so I, again, help me. And, you know, what... I, I guess what, I, one more thing. I mean, as well as the 14th Amendment, I mean— Section five says Congress has a role in creating legislation to achieve the the above objectives in the Fourteenth Amendment. So, I mean, just contextually, I I don't see the argument at all contextually into the Fourteenth Amendment. This seems to be clear to Chris's point. It seems to be a clear congressional power on on this uh, paying the debts. Well, be, well, again, we have an obligation. All right, a as a duty as a nation. All right. 
it's my understanding, uh, to fulfill all right, our contractual obligations to, and then again, as section four, uh, uh, you know, specifically says the validity of the public debt of the United States authorized by law. All right. So Congress did that. They authorized it, including debts incurred for payment of, you know, yada, 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 shall not be questioned. All right. Did you just yada, yada, the 14th amendment? Uh, yeah, some of it. I did. <laughs> yada, yada. Uh, there. Uh, but, uh, you know, <laughs> Again, the president is taking care that that law, all right, that we fulfill our obligations is faithfully executed. And that's the point. If if a if a branch, all right, if the system breaks down some somehow, I guess my question to the two of you is what's the remedy then? Because again, Chris is okay with it sounded to me, Chris, that you're okay with DACA. The you're well, okay with again, the president. I because a law a spin, is passed, prosecutorial let, discretion. Let me that the president's putting his spin on the meaning of the law. All right, through uh, again this fuzzy notion of prosecutorial discretion. What's the difference in the president putting his spin here? All right, which would to me is a is is a very clear danger to the country's you know uh, uh, standing in the world of saying, listen, Congress. You have an obligation. You're not doing it. So, boom, I'm going to take care that these laws are faithfully executed. I just don't see I don't understand the difference. There's well, no budget for him to faithfully execute. He's not, he's not doing it with the budget. He's again, the, the debt limit is an arbitrary line. All yes. right. What we're talking about is, is just you know, uh, uh, obligating the federal government to borrow. All right, and raise the debt ceiling. That itself is not a constitutional provision. That's something that Congress created heck in the 20th century. That is a statutory provision created by Congress. So therefore, is a statutory provision for Congress to deal with. I think I, I'm listening to this, David, and I'm and I understand the I, I, I guess my I just have it makes me a little nervous to think about the president doing that. I'm thinking again of uh, I mentioned this case earlier, students, uh, Youngstown Seed to Youngstown Sheet and Tube Cup versus Sawyer that came about uh, during the Korean War with President Truman. And Justice Jackson, one of my favorites, who wrote, uh, it's not the controlling opinion, but he wrote a concurrence. And he talked about this twilight zone of presidential powers. And he says, in the, and I'm paraphrasing, so I'm not going to get it quoted exactly, but he says, when the constant, when the, when the, the president's power is at its highest, or zenith, I think, as he uses, uh, when the Congress and the Constitution has spoken, right? So if the Congress has allowed for the president to do this, or the Constitution allows for the president to do this, that's when his powers are at his highest. His powers are at his lowest when the Congress and the, the Constitution have spoken against that movement. However, when Congress is silent and the Constitution is silent, the president's powers and energy, he calls the zone of twilight or the twilight zone of executive powers because it's not really sure you know uh, to, to, to steal tim's phrase we've entered into this squishy uh realm of executive power in this case though david i don't think it's squishy because i think with the budget and the the and the paying the debt that is a congressional power it's you know it's the congress being feckless or ineffective um how many times has the Congress been ineffective on so many things? Would we want the president to step in to take that power? And I, I just don't think so because it's not a presidential power. It's not an executive power. So professor Williams, uh, in your opinion, there, there's this, especially, you know, very, I, I guess, relatively contemporary criticism uh, uh, by members of a, a political one political party i guess uh you know complaining about the administrative state uh and uh they seem to be arguing in my understanding that the creation of the administration administrative state state maybe serves a purpose but that has been abused over the last you know especially 20 30 40 years or whatever by the executive branch that the executive branch has used that congressional authorization for an agency there to to expand, you know, uh, significantly presidential power. 
Do you see it that way or do you see it that just Congress is just writing bad, using bad language when creating administrative agencies? How do you see that? Yeah, I mean, I, I see this as a as a dance and it's, it needs to take, you have to have two partners for this dance. So I think it's a little bit of um, uh, presidents and executives wanting this authority and it's a little bit of, of Congress has been delegating. But I I think it's important for the students to like, Think about the history of this, right? And um, in terms of what we we as people wanted our government to do, um, changed dramatically um, 120 years ago or so. And it was the progressives. It was Wilson at first who who imagined a much bigger role for the executive branch and Congress to pass legislation and take care that those laws are. <laughs> Uh, effectively, you know, administered to solve the growing complexity of problems in United States society. And this really takes off during the Great Depression, right? Um, um, and everything that that has come out of the 1920s and 30s has been because Congress allowed it to happen, right? I mean, the president doesn't get to create agencies or departments on his or her own. They need to be created by the legislative branch. Um, and so each step of this dance, Congress at some point has to allow the creation of something, and then it's up to the president to take care that what those agencies are supposed to do is done. So for example, um, you know, the Department of Homeland Security was, was, came into creation through an act of Congress in 2003. It's something President Bush lobbied for after 9-11, um, it has 240,000 employees now. It's the third largest largest uh, uh, um, department. And I'm sure that there are many people on the right and the left who could complain. <laughs> if you go through and look at some of these agencies within that body, you might ask yourself, um, do we really need all these? Or what is going on here? You know, looking at some of them, there was a, um, I'm not gonna be able to find it, so it's okay. I will put it into the notes. But I think the point is here um, is that it is Congress giving some authority over to the executive branch, partly through sort of a public support for that, public desire. But then do presidents take that and then run, push, push as much as they can against the boundaries of what they can do within those agencies? You bet. So I, I think it is a combination, but I think students need to think about how the complexity of life factors into this. So we're asking government to help solve problems for us. And I think that you also have to think about the extent to which people are desiring the government to solve these things. And that's going to, that's going to create more agencies to do the work. I'm just, I'm curious, Mike, is it even possible for Congress to write legislation for administration in such in precise language that it can anticipate <laughs> varying circumstances. I mean, I'm just wondering about the critics who, you know, who complain, well, presidents are going, you know, they have too much, too much leeway and, and they abuse that power. Yeah. You know, it needs to go back to Congress and you go, well, can Congress write language like that? I they, mean, they, go ahead. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a good question. And to me, like the way I, I learned this was the roots of civil law versus common law. Right. And there are, there are countries who have an approach to try, the legislatures do try to write up le legislation that accounts for all these different types of hypo hypotheticals and all these details, and they create these huge codes, right? The legislative branch is doing that versus bureaucrats, civil servants. I, I think though, so I guess to answer your question is, um, I think it would be really hard for our Congress to do that work um, I think it's hard for any Congress to do that work. I think there's a reason why most all developed democracies have a professional, dedicated civil service to help with the implementation of this, because this is not something that elected officials have the, the training or expertise to do. Well, didn't I mean, uh, didn't they try, David, like in the 40s, uh, the Administrative Procedures Act? I mean, they, they attempted to create rules about all these agencies. I, I think it's interesting 15 years after there was an explosion <laughs> of administrative agencies in the New Deal. 
So, so I mean, they tried to create the procedural laws. Now, and, writing and, writing the regs. I mean, there's no way. Uh, there's no way. I, I, you know, I, there's. I mean, you look at our Congress. Do you want them writing regs? I mean, I mean, they they can't even find the men's room. Some of them. <laughs> so, so I guess I, I guess then what what do you say? I mean, what do you say to Mike? I mean, what I'm I guess what I'm wondering, Mike, do you have any example where you where you would point to a specific administration and go there's an example all right of an executive taking congressional language and running way too far with it and maybe crossing the line in, in the context of rule of law well wasn't that wasn't that the whole case in uh Schechter? i mean uh that these agencies uh were created and and the argument was this is this is run too far and uh so I think in a couple of those, uh, Butler was a case and Schechter Poultry was another one of those where an agency that was created got in somebody's uh, buzzsaw and thought it went too far. Okay, that's that's in the first, what, five years of the right. new deal? Right. And, and the, 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 the explosion of this, uh, of these administrative agencies uh, there. And, and, and did the court, how, how did the court deal with those early cases, Tim? I mean, did they did well, they I, say Congress needs to be more precise? Oh man, I'm way over my skis here on this. I, I think the the original issue, well, there's a lot of issues, but one of them was the delegation doctrine. Could Congress delegate authority to a coordinate uh, to a different branch? And uh, I think, as I understood it, they were basing that argument was based in a this court decision in the late 1800s. I don't have it off the top of my head, where they they actually said that there was no such thing as a delegation doctrine, that it was not constitutionally sound uh, to delegate. So I think a lot of the uh, the rattle and hum in those cases in the 30s or delegation harkened back to that case th you know, 20, 30 years earlier. Mike? I don't, man, it's, I, it's hard for me to come up with an example off the top of my head. And I think this example I'm coming up with is probably not the best one, but I'm thinking back to um, President Reagan and the National Security Advisory and Ollie North, there he's going, it's not even the Twilight Zone, he's going against what Congress wanted. But um, yeah, I don't, well, look, I'm, I, don't, I'm wondering, I can't think. Maybe others have an example. Well, I I'm wondering, Chris, because um, we talked about DACA, all right? And right now, the way I understand it is, is the court has yet to rule clearly on the whole situation with DACA. Is that correct? It's gone, yeah, it's gone back and forth. Uh, you've had but states DAPA, like but, but DAPA, they did. DAPA, they did say that the executive branch went too far in using its so called prosecutorial discretion. Is but that yeah, correct? Yes. And, you know, to go back to your prior discussion, too, about this, the Tim talking about Schachter and, and certainly the stuff coming out of the, uh, the early days of the New Deal. And no matter students, when no matter what you're talking about, we're talking about these legal doctrines. You can't discount the politics of the day. You've got to consider uh, what groups are pushing back, perhaps against uh, you know Schechter Poultry, uh, against DAPA, uh, against uh, <laughs> Oliver North, and and uh, doing an end run around Congress. I mean, that was in uh, the uh, Contra Rebel scandal. Um, the Reagan administration. So, you know, there are politics at play here from those that are trying to curtail power and those that are trying to expand power. Um, so I, I want to make sure the students are aware of that. Uh, and so, yeah, DAPA has been, I think, struck down. David, I think you're correct. Yeah. But DACA yeah. is still, DACA is still floating around out there. And it's unfortunately because at one point, these kids are now adults, right? They've gone to they've gone to school, they've gone to college, they've got families, they got jobs. You know, they're ingrained in American society as as a, as American as anybody, and uh, and you know, all it takes is an opinion to pull the rug out from underneath them. I was doing a quick search here because I remember talking about this this summer. I just want to share this with the students. Um, you know, do you guys have any, you know how many ac executive agencies there are today? More than I have digits. Uh, yes, this is from the Administrative Conference of the United States, which lists 115 agencies in, in its appendix of most uh, the recent source book, the United States 
executive agencies uh, had the following to say. So these are the people that are supposed to know. <laughs> oh, no. There is there is no authoritative list of government agencies. <laughs> so this is this is from the Administrative Conference of the United States. They're supposed to know. And they say there's no authoritative list of government agencies. And I think of the first cabinet in the Washington's first cabinet. Well, Secretary of State, Secretary of Treasury, Secretary of War and a postmaster general. Uh, and attorney general. Uh, eventually the attorney general. Yeah. So justice, justice department was not created though. Justice department comes. Oh, no, no, no. Right. Yeah. Right. So, right. I mean, you're talking four, four and a half. Right. As Tim says, though, the world, you know, that's context. The world has changed drastically. And, and, you know, uh, if, if in the 1930s you want the federal government, to do these things, it, you know, it's obvious you're going to have to create agents. I'm just, I'm, I, you know, but Congress has created all of these, you know, undocumented agencies, <laughs> correct? There, Chris. Uh, no, no, nobody knows how many, that, but you, they, they've all been created by Congress. These agencies don't come into existence without the Congress's stamp of approval. So I'm, I'm still like to I mean, I'm still wrestling with the fact how in the heck did Richard Nixon create the EPA? I mean, well, in uh, in the words of one of our uh, our bestest friends from the past, Richard Milhouse Nixon was the most liberal president of the 20th century. <laughs> I, 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 yes, Mike. Well, I just wanted to add to the politics point that Chris brought up. And it's very easy, students, like you could start going down some rabbit holes and, and it gets kind of silly. So let me share with you the example from. Department of Homeland Security has 22 different agencies in it. And one agency is, is called the Plum Island Animal Disease Center, right? I didn't look up, I don't know, I don't know Plum Island, I don't know. But the fact that we don't know, I bet there is a constituency that um, thought it needed this. And there was a person, an elected official who thought that they were gonna get some benefit for creating this, right, and having it administered. And just because we aren't, we don't know of all the details of, of some of these funny sounding agencies doesn't mean that they're not serving a purpose. Now, it could also mean that they did serve a purpose once, but now they don't, and we need to get rid of it. And that's the tricky thing with, with, with building out agencies. They're pretty easy to create, and they're really hard to get rid of. Agencies will start morphing themselves um, coming up with new mission <laughs> statements and new things to do. And and that to me is a, one of the strongest critiques one can make of the administrative state. It, it's not that there's the state shouldn't be doing things. It's like, do we have agencies that have fulfilled their purpose, right? And that right now they're just sticking around because they're entrenched. I had uh, I ran across this term the other day as I was looking into this. There was this one uh, article by a political scientist. He was making the argument, this is to Mike's point, that there's this thing called agency capture, yeah. uh, that there's a constituency that really gloms onto an agency and they wind up controlling it ra rather than being regulated by the agency. They control the agency. Uh, now, to me, that kind of harkens back in the old days right, when I was in a classroom with this idea of um, uh, right. you know, Iron Triangle, right? Uh, regulators go get private sector jobs. I mean, there's this revolving door, and I think that plays into this idea of capture. But ultimately, I, you know, I, Mike's idea about felt needs. I mean, I, I can't help but think this. This is a part I think of the all evolving constitutional theory. There, uh, I mean, the original in the modern sense. I think the ICC was the, was one of the first. Well, the felt needs at the time is that we, there need to be regulation of the railroads. Mm -hmm. That's a real felt need. And there's this agency. I mean, in the 30s, there's all kinds of agencies that pop up because of felt needs. Uh, EPA uh, felt need in the 70s. I mean, our, our cities are unbreathable. Uh, so uh, Homeland Security. So I think this felt needs that Mike has referenced is a political reality, but it also, I think, can con uh, connect to this. Are we comfortable with an evolving constitution and how much of an evolving constitution which involves a lot of interpretation <laughs> and our to our present concern, the take care clause. I'm I'm just worried that we're now gonna get a bunch of hate mail from Plum Island folks that now are gonna think that Mike was kind of making fun of them. So I gotta There's look into that. 
as yeah. long as they don't throw plums at me, I'm fine with it. Okay. Uh, so, uh, okay. I gotta, I gotta kind of go back before we go forward, professor Moore. And I, I tried in our initial questions. Is there any controversy surrounding the take care clause? Because well, it sounded it, in the it sounded in the initial discussion that you no, know, this is real simple. It's real straightforward. The president takes care of what Congress uh, tells him to take care of, and uh, we can all hold hands and sing "We Are the World." Uh, well, if if your uh, "We the People" teachers you're talking to are right, then there is a controversy because they've created a controversy by saying it's a lot more than it actually is. Okay, it's connected to prerogative power. Uh, heck no. Uh, so there's a controversy in interpreting it. Well, first of all, I think that most of if you if, if first of all, can you describe to me your understanding of prerogative power? What is it? What is its definition and what's its implication? Well, in uh, it emerges again in a time frame where there's there's absolute um, absolute authority in the, in the divine right. Does yeah. the president of the United States have some prerogatives? um maybe okay and so you know again i'm not going to pretend to be uh well versed or uh in anywhere close but i know that we have a a a friend of ours a very very uh you know uh, important scholar and judge uh there who argued very strongly about the role or the the function of prerogative in the american constitutional system found in the executive uh, there. I I don't. Uh, a lot of that depends on how you're interpreting globally interpreting Article Two. Uh, I I wouldn't go that far. I mean, yes, the the president has prerogative power over, uh, you know, once the military is called, uh, once war has been declared. I mean, there are prerogatives in there, but uh, as broadly as I think we've come to accept, I would say no. Well, I'm going to I'm going to disagree and I use a concrete example. And that was um, the use of signing statements by President Bush, uh, uh, George uh, W. Bush, uh, when Congress under the push from the former Senator John McCain about yeah. outlawing torture, uh, when he says it's not about who they are, it's about who we are. Um, and yet uh, when this is passed by Congress, and he issues a signing statement, which actually allows him a prerogative to be able to decide when that law will be enforced. Well, I so, just thought David was asking me about back in the day. But, I mean, oh, you're right. I mean, it, it has evolved to that, right? Right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think that the, the clause, I mean, there, I think, I don't know that there's controversy around the clause, David, but I think it certainly um, opens itself to interpretation. You know, can the president enforce a law as he or she do, doesn't believe are constitutional? I mean, check, correct me if I'm wrong, Tim, but didn't Jefferson not enforce the Sedition Law, the Sedition Act, until it was repealed? And and went and pardoned him. Yeah. So, I mean, um, I think it. I think this is why this question is interesting, because I think on one hand, the Take Care Clause has perhaps enhanced executive power, but it also has constrained executive power. Um, and we've seen executives use that. But again, going back to our original, one of the first things we talked about, you can't look at that as a set aside. You have to look at it in the framework of the Constitution and the separation of powers, in, you know, ingrained in the document, one of the fundamental parts of the document. So, OK, I'll, I'll accept an 18th century, but I think by the 20th century, all right, uh, in this evolving constitutionalism uh, here, that it does become problematical, and most definitely in the 21st century. Yep. I mean, let's 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 be clear. And I don't know how it's going to turn out, but we have a former president who's running for president again, but who has been indicted. And one of the defenses that they are using is that they were using the take care clause to make sure that the election of 2020 was carried out. All right, uh, faithful to the law. All right, now. You know, and, and that seems to me to be somewhat controversial uh, uh, there. And but and I don't think any one of you can tell me with a straight face that that won't pass muster with the current Supreme Court. Well, we don't. Uh, well, ultimately, we don't know about with the current Supreme Court. You might be right. Um, but uh, 
what law the <laughs> what law were they trying to make, be sure was faithfully executed? <laughs> They did a lot of mental, you know that as well as anybody, David, they did a lot of mental gymnastics with the law they were basing all of this on. Uh, I mean, thank you, Professor uh, Eastman. Well, what I, I guess, I guess what I'm, my frustration I'm experiencing right now is, is, <laughs> you know, in the, I, I, I guess in the original language, I'm, it, it seems to me that most we, the people questions uh, uh, imply some gray area, some fuzziness, and some controversy in them. Uh, and I guess I'm finding, I'm a little frustrated here because it, 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 it seems to me that what you're saying, at least in its original language and structure, there is no controversy, fuzziness, or problem. Yes, it evolves to that in the 20th century, quite possibly. Chris mentioned signing statements, although I'm not bothered by signing statements, Chris, because in the end, all right, a signing statement really has no power unless the president acts on it. And of course, there's checks on that. All right, there's congressional checks and there's judicial checks. If the president says, I'm going to only interpret it this way and actually does that, all right, uh, there's still checks uh, uh, on that. Uh, some, some associate the executive orders as being controversial uh, there. And, you know, we went through a period of time where people were all up in the air about executive orders. But again, my sense is there's checks on that. Uh, so I'm just trying to figure out, you know, the authors of this question. All right. There's there is an implied, I guess, gray area or controversy. And I'm not quite getting what that is. Can you guys well, help I, me out? Well, I think um, I'm going to hold up a book. So bear with me. Uh, and I would encourage I'll put this in the resources. Fantastic book. The Pacificus Helvidius Debates, it's a very thin volume, as you can see, but it really deals somewhat with this whole issue in terms of the power of the executive. And um, this is Madison and Hamilton writing as, well, um, Hamilton's writing as Pacificus and Madison is writing as Helvidius. And they're arguing about the how far the executive power goes. And so and the take care clause is not specifically mentioned, but Madison as Helvidius certainly is talking about the faithful execution of the laws as in, as he sees it versus, uh, you know, Hamilton at, at how he sees it. So this actually has been somewhat, I don't say controversial, but certainly open to interpretation from the very first administration. So yeah. I think it, you know, and I think what we've seen here over time is and then we've said this, and I I know I've said this. As you see, Congress being playing less of a role, withdrawing itself, not speaking, so to speak, not providing guidance. You see, executive power grows over time, and so this is just one of those other areas that has uh, provided uh, um, growth for the executive power. So this debate over interpretation of, of executive power. Is as old as the Republic itself. Um, a more more modern sense, though, as the uh, executive agencies have grown and Congress has become, I don't know, uh, less effective. Uh, they, that uh, we see the executive power grow. I don't know if that if that is, it provides any salve for you or not, David. But um, I think that's kind of what happens. Mike, did you have something? Yeah, I'm not sure if this is going to take us off to where we don't want to go, then just pull us, pull us back. Um, I think this is bringing to mind Project 2025, and I'd have the students think about this is um, this is an idea of uh, President Trump has, former President Trump has talked about, um, Heritage Foundation is behind, and it's about this idea of the, the, the issue, it's not that presidents don't have the ability through the take care clause, it's like you need the right people, the right people in the bureaucracy to take care of the laws being executed the way you want it executed. So this 2025 project is about um, if former President Trump is reelected to do a much better job of putting people loyal to his ideology into these administrative positions. And to me, that just strikes me as a as a plan by someone who understands much better how the executive branch works and a way <laughs> to to play within the bounds of the rules 
to be able to more effectively get the policies implemented the way he wants. And what brings this to mind, though, is the next phrase of the take care clause, faithfully executed. And I just, it just, I don't have an answer for this. I'm just ask, asking students to, I guess, think along with me with this. If you are the executive and you are handpicking not just your political appointees, but civil servants to execute the law, is that faithfully executing it in the way that the founders intended, or is that unfaithfully executing? I don't know. Um, but I think my, my that's, I mean, uh, it's not the, the appointment issue, right? I mean, executives have always been able to appoint who they want. And, and Tim even mentioned from the jump about Madison supporting, eventually coming around to supporting the ability of the president to dismiss people as well, right? I think Madison's position originally was no, but I think he comes around to the idea that, well, if we're going to hold the, the president responsible for the administration, right, the execution of the laws, we should free him to be able, or her eventually, to hire and fire when need be, unless the, the Constitution requires Senate approval. So, I mean, appointing people to positions is is not the issue. I think if, if you read carefully the Project 2025, it's what they plan on doing. No, no, that's what I mean. But I mean, the my understanding, like there, in a bureaucracy that has federal bureaucracy, it has what three to four million people, depending on whether you count the military. Right now, the president's appoint about four thousand. Um, from what I'm reading with Project 2025, it's a list of twenty thousand or more, and um, so it would be, it would be an appointment process that would be different than what we've seen. Previously, so not, yeah, replacing a lot of the bureaucrats that stay in, regardless of who's in power. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I mean, wasn't that the point? I mean, <laughs> I mean, the spoil. I think we addressed the spoil system back in the in, in the nineteenth century, and with the um, ultimately with the Pendleton Act. But uh, so it, it will be interesting to see how that plays out. I can't help but think uh, maybe I, I'm in listening to our discussion. Maybe I am convinced now that there is a royal prerogative, but it's maybe the agencies because <laughs> they make, excuse me, they don't make laws, they make rules and um, they enforce them and they have their own courts, you know, uh, administrative hearings, excuse me, they're not courts. But so I, I wonder, <laughs> I wonder, so a guy like uh, Bannon, I think, is probably on to something that it's, you know, he's he's taking on what he probably, I don't want to speak for him, but he probably would say that there's an out of control bureaucracy that behaves like a royal prerogative. And that agency, and this, I mean, as Mike was talking about Project uh, 2025, it, it kind of sounds to me like somebody believes there is a royal prerogative, David. Uh, so, so you're in good company there with Bannon, I guess. <laughs> Thanks for that. Uh, so, <laughs> sorry, so, that was that was a cheap shot. I'm no, sorry. No, that was a good shot, uh, Chris. <laughs> so, let's get to the administrative state and how this is, I guess, supposed to function. Uh, in 1984, the Supreme Court established the Chevron Doctrine, uh, oh, which man. gave relatively broad latitude to the executive branch to enforce administrative policies. However, in 2022, the Roberts Court established the Major Questions Doctrine, which would null and void, it seems to me, much of the Chevron Doctrine. Can you explain a little bit these two doctrines and provide your insights on which one you think better reflects the spirit of American constitutionalism in the 21st century? You go, Chris. Uh, uh, neither, <laughs> but um, that's good. Uh, okay, I, that works. Why? Uh, well, the Chevron doctrine. I think the the court realized, you know, we're not smart enough to figure out whether or not the, the EPA should be doing what they're doing, and you know, we're not really, really sure about this. And these people in this agency, uh, they've been doing this for a while, and we we should like maybe think that they know what they're doing and we'll go from there and we'll defer to these executive agencies in as tim mentioned the quasi legislative and the quasi judicial power that these agencies have in this case when we're not really sure and congress uh, hard to believe that congress would not not write the law so specifically i know um that uh, yeah um that sarcasm students sorry um that we're going to defer to these agencies to carry out the law 
as, you know, again, somewhat prosecutorial discretion. They're going to carry out the law or prosecute the law uh, as best as they see fit. And that's the Chevron doctrine. As, as you mentioned, David, it's been in, it's been in since 1984. Uh, Chevron USA Incorporated versus Natural Resources Defense Council is the case. I'll put something in the links to that as well, or to the resources as well, and kids can look that up. Fast forward, well, and actually, you know, the the case that you know people are talking about is West, West Virginia versus Environmental Protection Agency, which is what 2022, I think, is that right? Yeah. But they've they've actually used this before in other cases. They've just never really called it the major questions doctrine, right? Or MQ MQD now, I guess, is what all the the cool kids are calling it, MQD, right? Uh, the major questions doctrine. They've used it in a, in a series of cases uh, up to this point in basically reining in some of these agencies. And I'm going to provide a really good link in the resources. Uh, it's from the Congressional Research Service. Um, and um, you'll have a list of uh, case law I mean, dating back and in, in where they've, the court has reined these uh, agencies in. But this is a, the West Virginia case uh, is the first time they've actually used this language of this major questions doctrine um and you know the question before the court in that case is does the environmental protection agency have the authority to regulate gas emissions greenhouse gas emissions uh in virtually any industry so as long as it considers costs non-air impacts energy requirements and you know those so there's a how far does the epa's power go right and they said, no, Congress didn't, in the Clean Air Act, they did not authorize the EPA to do this. And they're, they said there, and I'm going to quote here, I want to make sure I get this right, there are extraordinary cases, history and breadth of the authority that agency is asserted, and the economic and political significance. As, so there is this whole idea that, eh, you know, in these really big questions, we're going to step in. Well, instead of asking, no, but, but the, let me. The, but the problem here is, David, and for the students, there's you know a lot of times we think of like okay, they created a, a you know a clear and present danger doctrine for free speech, or they create that line so people know where the line is. No one knows where this line is in the MQD. So that, just, yeah, that that was my follow up question. Is is the, therein lies the problem? Is how do they distinguish between a major question? Versus a minor question. They know I, it I, when they see it. it. Okay, so it's like pornography. Thank you very much, yeah. uh, uh, Professor Moore. I guess. I will, I, I, just, let me, let me, Dave. Right. I'm sorry. One more point. I just was reading an article today in the New York Times, and I'll share the link uh, in the resources. Uh, and the headline is uh, "Polluting Industries Say the Cost of Cleaner Air Is Too High." Right. Right. And um, this is one of the sentences in the lead paragraph, but it says, "By law." The agency isn't supposed to consider the impact on polluting industries. In practice, it does. And those industries warning of dire economic consequences. So, I mean, is this going to be, is this going to fall into the major questions doctrine? It certainly, it certainly sounds like it will. So. Right. So I guess, I guess here's my other question. So you, you dealt with, with one of them and that is what's a major question, but <laughs> with the Chevron and, and, and the court's move here, I don't I don't see the problem. That is, I don't understand why the courts get involved, which is what they said in the Chevron case. We're you know, we're not the guys. So we're not the team you should be coming to to decide environmental policy. And so if somebody has a problem with an administrative agency to me is go to Congress and say, change the law, not go to the courts there which was the chevron thing uh there so i mean that that's my problem it looks like you're on board with me with that well i think what what and i just thought about this earlier today um thinking about this evening and our discussion that we're going to have and um and again i'm i'm tired i, I i'm tired of ripping on congress but you know they're an easy there's they're uh they're easy like a rent a mule easy to beat um as they continue to do a poor job of writing legislation, and I do believe they have been doing a poor job of writing legislation and not being clear, the administrative agencies will have to enact these and the president will have to carry out these laws, this take care clause, right? They'll have to carry out these and without clear guidance, 
And so when anybody's apple cart gets upset, they're going to challenge that administrative agency for going too far. And with the court establishing this doctrine, this major question is doctrine, which allows them to decide when they want to, when to step in a limit. It's going to, it's imperative that Congress do a, a better job of writing legislation to be clear on what needs to happen. Going back, I'm going back to Justice Jackson in the idea of, you know, when is the president's power to decide when Congress and Constitution are clear, when they have spoken. And Congress has done a pretty poor job of speaking lately. So, Professor Williams, um, I think in some ways you already kind of addressed this, but I'll, I'll ask it uh, anyway. And that's it's our comparative question, as I think it's always important for kids, uh, you know, to look beyond the, the borders of the United States when it comes to constitutional governance and, and law and such. Uh, so where's where's the United States fall comparatively when it comes to administrative agencies and and you know legislative deference to an administrative state? Are we are we number one as even though as I think uh, was said, we don't know how many agencies there are. Uh, but are we number one? Are we an outlier? Or are we kind of, you know, amongst a, 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 you know, a, a many uh, there? Yeah, no, this is, um, I was appreciative that you asked this question because it's been a while that I've looked into the details of this. And in my mind, I was like, I, I don't, I don't think we're number one with this question, but I, I finally came across a Brookings uh, report that I'll we'll put into the show notes that verifies what my what I thought I had taught on this a decade ago. Um, it it kind of, like students, it kind of depends on how, what what counts for you, right? So um, I know it's always definitional and counting stuff up in political science. Um, but if you look at federal employees, right? And not those who are just contracted, right? Cause that's a whole different realm. Um, federal employees, there's about, two and a half million or so that are related to the military, another two and a half million just in the civil service, around five million. Of those two and a half million in the civil service, um, 60% are either working for defense, veterans, or homeland security. So immediately when you start looking at like the federal administrative state, you immediately see it is really dominated by security issues and military. So that's that's one takeaway. Um, I think the, the second takeaway with this is compared to other democratic countries, uh, especially those in Europe and those and even the United Kingdom, as a percentage of our of the workforce is the way you measure this. As a percentage of the workforce, we actually have uh, one of the smallest no, in terms of the number of people working for the federal government. No and way. That's that's the data, and it has to do with the scope of our state functions. So for example, if you're a European state, and if, if it's part of your scope, not just to provide defense, but to provide healthcare, to provide um, uh, childcare, to provide education, you need government people who are doing that. And because the scope of this our US state is not as large as others, it makes some sense that there's going to be more limited. Um, also, as a percentage of our workforce, it's declined the last uh, 30 years, which isn't surprising. 30, 40 years, the the the, you know, President Reagan's famous quip, you know, like the the there's nothing the federal yeah. government can do to help you. Like that has come into fruition, where um, we know that we actually probably need more people um, working in the federal government. So I'll share the resource, and Chris, if you can find other things that. Well, I'm, my question, Mike, and I just I, I, I don't I'm not doubting you, but my question is, um, should we include state employees in that as well? Yeah, yeah, so we and we can. So here's if you look at all the people at all different levels of government working for the government, it's about 15 percent of the workforce. It's about 24 okay. million. How's now, that compared to, say, India, the second largest democracy? Um. Actually, India was the one example I found that actually might like that's a lot of people. I couldn't find the numbers that compare all government employees at all at different levels. But there you might you might be right. Your hunch is that we're probably number one or close. That's more of a function of 
the fact that we de- decentralize so, so much, yeah. right? Our favorite F word, federalism. Yeah. I mean, most European countries are unitary systems. So whereas their their state capacity, their their scope is is they cover more things, they're not creating employment at the local level because it's the central government that's just doing it. So you're right. I think if we just look at all government workers, we may be number one. But so far in this discussion, we've been really just talking about federal agencies. Right. Um, but yeah, students, yeah, take what Chris said exactly right. I mean, you could look at your own state, look at your state agencies, look at your local agencies, and you could have that information ready to go and see how that compares. Um, so it, it, like most things, it all depends on how you break it down, how you define it, and what you want to compare. Make sure you're comparing apples to apples and not apples to oranges. So we've come to the uh, end of uh, this discussion uh, here. And as we uh, traditionally do, we'll ask our scholars to provide some final insights, recommendations, or thoughts. And I think the first thing uh, we want to do is uh, we want to get some clarification from Professor Kavanaugh on uh, why would you beat a rented mule in the first place? Uh, and again, I'm a, I'm a beach boy, city boy, so I don't know much about mules uh, there. But that was quite the bumper sticker uh, phrase there, uh, Professor Kavanaugh. You want to clarify? Well, because I didn't want to say get beaten like a redheaded stepchild because I didn't think that was going to be appropriate. So I went with, uh, I'm sure I'll hear from PETA. Um, so <laughs> and I didn't and the, wanna... the, the uh, Bum Island chapter of PETA. <laughs> That was good. All right. Final insights, uh, recommendations there, <laughs> Professor Kavanaugh? <laughs> oh, my God. Just send me my check. I'm on my way. Um, no, I think this is I think I, I think I want students to think about this question in terms of has the take care clause allowed presidents to expand their power or has it contracted executive power? And if so, how? And do not forget, there are other branches of government here. Right. I think the I think the last bullet question asks you about, you know, uh, checks on administrative agencies. So, I mean, these other branches, the legislative branch, the number one branch, uh, what role does it play and what role have the courts played, which we didn't get into too much this evening in terms of either expanding executive power or limiting executive power when it comes to taking care of the lobby faithfully executed. And I'm telling you, this is. American history is full of examples of both. So have them figure out which way you're going to have your twig bent, but make sure you got a lot of examples and prepare for pushback, no matter which which way you uh, take this question. Professor Moore. Yeah, I, I, I want to take Mike's idea of um, felt needs as a big, I, I, think of, I think a valid way to think about the growth of agencies. So what I would recommend is however many people you have on, have on your panel, if there's three or four or whatever, each each student take take three or four agencies and read up on them and know what what statutory basis, where in the Constitution can you make an argument that this that this is based in? And then and then um and then argue about how how valid is this constitutional rationale for this agency um and how does it fit within the felt needs like uh, nasa one of those great felt need moments of an agency um in the cold war and you know in the whole space race thing so so i i think mike's mike's really that that comment that he made earlier that these agencies may be a function of felt needs so I'd camp out on that and analyze these agencies, you know, put to, you know, put a half a dozen or so in your belt and be able to talk about that. Professor Williams. Yeah, I think um, to go kind of go along with Tim's point, in addition to maybe looking at the agencies, um, think about which agencies that you um, may have the most likelihood to come into contact with or know someone so, for example, the Social Security Administration, that is a federal agency. And if you if you know anyone in your family who's getting Social Security checks and um, to talk to them about the experience of what it's like to interact with agencies, this this question is is kind of it's a really good question, I think. 
it's definitely tilted to be like, oh, are these agencies too powerful? Are they doing too much? And I, I think you should also be thinking about, um, do they have enough capacity to do what they say they're going to do, right? Um, I, I did one more click as we were talking, and the Plum Island Animal Disease Center has been around since 1954, and it's 400 employees who are looking about how to prevent the spread of animal disease in the United States. So it's a relatively, obviously, I think, important group. Um, I don't know how many other agencies in our federal government are thinking about animal disease, but it's so this is the rabies squad. It's something, I guess now we're going to get hate mail. I'm trying to clean this up for us. <laughs> we got the mule lobby coming after us. And now we got <laughs> So anyway, students, I would I would be thinking about like um, are some of our administrative agencies like the FDA, food drug, are, are they cut too thin? Are they actually not powerful enough to be doing what their missions are? So, I think you should explore that. Well. I'm, I want to. I'm sorry. I want one more. Sorry, I, I hate to do this, but uh, also students, be aware that there are executive departments. There is the executive office of the presidency, yeah. right? and there are independent agencies. So yeah. we have different we have different creatures here. So make sure you understand the differences between those. Yeah, that's good. Uh, and the only thing I have to add is uh, in in the main main question there, uh, it implies uh, you know, that the president is uh, is given a duty. Uh, and I guess I'd like uh, students uh, to be able to kind of you know play with that. What what is that duty that the president has? How does that relate to maybe some Republican ideals and virtues uh, there? Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, or is that duty just subjective from administrative to to administration uh, there uh, uh, kind of thing? So uh, hopefully we've uh, shined some light on some uh, fuzziness uh, that existed. Uh, what we do know is it is uh, OK, I guess, to beat a rented mule. Um, I still don't beat, right your own, don't, beat your, don't beat your own mule. Oh, okay. Thank you. There, there is. Now I get it. Okay, we can. Yeah, be, isn't there a property rights issue going on with that? Uh, kind well, of do you drive a rental car like you drive your own car? Uh, yeah. No, I know the answer to that. That's no. So do, yeah. I, do I just Google rental mule? Like, how do I find this? It's right under tuna salad and mayonnaise. Yeah, no, it's Miracle tuna Whip. and Miracle Whip. Uh, there, yeah, kind of stuff. Uh, well, uh, so in our next session, you can let uh, Unit 5 know we'll be uh, talking about uh, uh, the Fourth Amendment and uh, the school site. Uh, they're a topic that I imagine every student in America uh, is uh, concerned with and uh, interested in. So until then, peace, love, yogurt tacos. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.